So welcome. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, attending this session in the European Sustainable Energy Week 2023. Um, it's fantastic to see so many familiar faces in the room, and it's, it's really a pleasure for me um, as the EFIG Rapporteur to, uh, to welcome you to this session. Just before we start, um, as with all the sessions that we have done in this uh, week shows, um, we'd like to make this participatory, which means that if you're in the room, think of questions and raise your hand when the, uh, when the appropriate moment arises. And for those of you who are joining us online, as you know and probably familiar and you'll see uh, later, there's a code uh, for the Slido um, question and answer system, which is being monitored by colleagues of ours. There it is on the screen right there. So you can use that QR code, scan it with your phone, find the link in the Slido, or use the code EUSEW2023TO, and that will get you to our session. That will allow you to ask, ask questions, and we will have a moderator on the Slido link providing those questions back to me for the Q&A. So uh, let's, hope, let's make this um, a very uh, active session. Um, I know you've got questions. And to kick us off and to provide the formal welcome, uh, I would like to give the floor to Claudia Canaverri. I'm going to introduce Claudia now, although she will speak twice. Claudia is the head of unit for energy efficiency at DG Enna. Um, Claudia um, has worked for the commission for 25 years. Um, she joined DG Enna in 2012, but before that, she was the political assistant to the Director General of DG uh, Communication, and she was a member of cabinet of the Environment Commissioner Stavros Dimas. She's a trained lawyer, um, admitted to the bar in Italy, and holds an LLM with merit from the London School of Economics. Claudia. Thank you very much, Peter, and uh, good morning, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a pleasure to welc uh, welcome all of you here in the room and those uh, connected online to this uh, very important uh, uh, session. Um, uh, the the, um, um, there, is, uh, there are two reasons for which this uh, session is uh, particularly special. The first one has to do with the past and with the present, uh, uh, namely the fact that EFIG celebrates uh, 10 years of activities this year. And this moves our memory back uh, to uh, the EFIG uh, 2015 uh, report, uh, which is a cornerstone in relation to the work uh, um, that we've uh, carried out in these years uh, on uh, energy efficiency investments uh, uh, in uh, the European Union. Uh, the report, uh, starting from the recognition of the strategic importance of energy efficiency, underlined the need for public and private entities to work together uh, and uh, 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 to collect uh, more data for energy efficiency investments uh, and stressed uh, the importance uh, for energy efficiency investments uh, to be grouped uh, to make them more attractive uh, and the need to work together for the de-risking uh, of energy efficiency investments. And uh, as we all know, energy efficiency has moved uh, a long way since the report was published in 2015. It is now at the top uh, of the EU energy priorities uh, and it is recognized as the simplest, uh, cheapest uh, and most effective way to uh, achieve uh, the EU Green Deal uh, objectives uh, and the objectives of the Repower EU. And in the last uh, 10 years, AFIG has been uh, uh, giving us uh, many useful tools, uh, starting from the underwriting uh, toolkit, uh, which is uh, uh, a tool to assist the financial institutions uh, to scale up uh, the deployment of capital in energy efficiency investments, uh, the deep database uh, with inform information excuse me, on more than 35,000 projects uh, and many reports and recommendations. So this is for the past and for the present. Uh, but the second reason why this uh, session is special has to do with the future. In fact, uh, today's events uh, mark the closing of AFIG. And this closure is not because there, is there are not enough uh, challenges uh, in energy efficiency financing today. On the contrary, in fact, uh, because we need uh, to scale up uh, our actions uh, to make sure that we properly and effectively finance uh, the EU clean uh, and fair energy transition towards uh, the 2050 uh, full decarbonisation. And to respond to this enhanced uh, challenge, the Commission is, as you know, planning a new initiative, the European Energy fi Efficiency Financing Coalition, to improve the good cooperation with financial stakeholders uh, and to try to push us uh, towards better implementation. And you will hear more about uh, this uh, initiative uh, uh, in the course of uh, uh, today's meetings. I would like to conclude uh, this uh, uh, short opening with a personal word of appreciation to the whole of the AFIG community who made AFIG possible and successful. It has been really a pleasure to work with you and to have been able to count on your cooperation, expertise, dedication, and professional and knowledgeable approach. 
and uh, uh, in, uh, in the Commission we have confidence uh, that uh, there is a lot, much more that we can ach achieve uh, together in the framework of the new coalition and beyond. And in fact, uh, AFIG has just uh, laid the ground uh, for us to continue working uh, further, uh, further together. So thank you very much and I wish all of us uh, a very successful session. So thank you very much, Claudia. Um, yes, please. What, for, for, for opening our session, and as many of you probably know, the uh, EFIG group is um, somewhat unique in the, in the, among uh, uh, sort of technical working groups in that it's co-convened uh, both by the European Commission, uh, DGN on, on the one hand, and by the United Nations Environment Programme Finance Initiative on the other hand. Um, later to today, we will have a formal uh, closing lunch in which the representative of UNFFI, um, Peggy Lefort, will actually give a speech representing the perspectives of their membership, which is financial institutions across the world, um, and how this unique form of collaboration has worked from the perspective of their organization. Um, we were going to have uh, Eric Usher join us to this session from Sweden, but for technical reasons, um, if you want to hear the UNFFI um, perspectives, you will have to join us for our lunch, which it, uh, we will be delighted to have all of you do, um, which will be downstairs. Um, it'll start at one o'clock, and we will have an opportunity there to hear again um, from different perspectives um, on the work of the EFIG. So uh, with, with that, um, what I was going to do uh, was welcome a, a very old friend of EFIG, e um, uh, Mechthild uh, Verstofer, who uh, today, when she opened the Sustain Sustainable Energy Week conference herself, she um, raised what EFIG has achieved in the opening address. So, so this morning, if you were there, um, uh, either online or in person, you would have heard her say that uh, EFIG in the last 10 years has really pioneered cooperation from the perspective of the Commission and, and that working together, she's found that the policymakers and financial institutions have indeed examined all the technical bottlenecks and, pr and published on them and that this is really a role model for how governments and the financial sector can work together. So um, as the rapporteur, um, I can also say that in conversations with international organizations that I've been having recently, the EFIG itself I would consider is a best practice, which means that other countries, I think, are quite carefully looking at what the EFIG has achieved with ideas that they might replicate an EFIG-like thing uh, within their countries. And so just for all of you, today um, this brochure was published and um, it's available online, so it's actually very, very... So because EFIG has a slightly clunky acronym, so one of the pieces of advice get, I would give to other people starting new initiatives like this is have a three-letter acronym because no <laughs> one can remember E-E-F-I-G and they get it wrong frequently. So, uh, but the good news about a long uh, uh, sort, of, sort of not well-used acronym is you just have to type it into Google and it finds the right website immediately. So it's on the Commission's website. You type in EFIG, hashtag EFIG for, for the tag and social media, and you'll find this uh, um, booklet. This booklet gives you the entire history of, uh, of the EFIG it also gives you, most importantly, QR codes to the extensive detail of the work. So uh, there's a, a section where you can very, very easily find the over 100 page reports, which uh, I and the teams here present have been diligently working on for all these years. So with that, uh, I'm going to invite Kalia back to the stand to talk to us about the perspectives from the Commission as a co-convener of EFIG. Director General Mechtir Versdorfer, uh, that, uh, who was mentioned by Peter, because uh, she unfortunately cannot be uh, with us uh, today. Um, so uh, I will be uh, delivering uh, uh, her speech, in fact. Um, so um, I'm very happy to be here today uh, to address uh, the EFIG uh, community and all those interested uh, in energy efficiency financing. The ambition of the Energy Commission on energy efficiency is clear and it is uh, known uh, worldwide. And it was uh, very much strengthened by uh, our president, uh, uh, Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, uh, in her re recent uh, uh, proposal to uh, set a dedicated uh, energy efficiency global target. Uh, at union level, energy efficiency is uh, the building block uh, for the European Green Deal and one of the key pillars uh, of Repower EU. Increasing uh, the energy efficiency of our systems uh, and saving uh, more energy will uh, firstly enable us to deliver on our decarbonization objectives uh, and secondly increase the union's uh, energy security by reducing dependence uh, on external supply and citizens uh, and businesses exposure to energy market uh, shocks. 
In addition, by investing in more efficient industrial, manufacturing, and serving service uh, processes, we increase uh, the competitiveness of our economy and of our enterprises. In March 2023, the co-legislators uh, struck uh, a very important political agreement uh, on the proposal for a recast uh, of the Energy Efficiency Directive, notably on the collective reduction of final energy consumption of at least 11.7% uh, in 2030, compared to the 2020 reference scenario. This legislation is an important uh, cornerstone uh, of the Fit for 55 package to enable the energy transition by paving the way to uh, a more efficient use of energy, by strengthening the exemplary role of the public sector, and by empowering consumers. With particular relevance to this uh, session, the Recast Energy Efficiency Directive strengthens the, the provisions uh, on energy efficiency financing. For example, member states uh, are requested to enhance energy efficiency investments by facilitating the establishment uh, of innovative financing schemes uh, and by promoting uh, the corrective development of the market uh, for green lending products uh, for energy efficiency. This objective is also shared uh, by uh, the Energy Performance of building, uh, Buildings Directive proposal, uh, and uh, it the idea is uh, to change uh, the way energy efficiency measures, uh, including building renovation, are financed. And our current financing methods, in fact, uh, will not be sufficient uh, in the long term. And I'm specifically talking about uh, the public financing, obviously. The predominant, predominant uh, grant-based public uh, schemes uh, with very high rates uh, uh, of public support in many cases uh, are no longer compatible with the scale uh, of an investment needed uh, and with the need to establish an economy, a market economy for these uh, products. This is because those needs uh, far outstrip the availability of uh, public funds, which is leaving us with an estimated financial gap of uh, 165 billion euros per year. Targeted, gra targeted grant-based support uh, remains relevant to provide the social safeguards to vulnerable low-income households uh, or as a de-risking source uh, for more innovative and ambitious projects. However, we need to move a step further. It is crucial to unlock private investment and scale up the energy efficiency market. In concrete terms, this means not only ensuring a wide offer of green loans and mortgages, but also a broader offer of innovative financing schemes, which monetizes energy efficiency and the possibility of use them to finance the costs of these instruments. And we need, therefore, to match available funding with existing technologies, uh, working uh, towards products uh, combining uh, technical assistance and finance, uh, and developing one-stop shop models. At the demand side, uh, we need consumers and enterprises to understand the potential of energy efficiency investments, uh, and that, uh, the way they, uh, that what they spend now will pay off in the future in terms of savings. These are, in our views, uh, just a couple of examples uh, applicable to commercial, residential, industrial sectors, uh, including when public as well, obviously, where public and private need to work together to overcome the existing bottlenecks. AFIG has proven uh, in the past 10 years uh, to be, um, uh, 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 let's say, to give an example on, of the fact that we can reach results uh, by working together. And these uh, will be showcased uh, in, uh, in this uh, session. And we now need uh, to bring uh, the cooperation to a further level to have an impact, uh, uh, let's say, a, a, a stronger impact uh, on uh, local and regional markets. For this reason, in the context of the Repower EU plan, which, as you know, is uh, the EU plan to phase out dependence from uh, Russian fossil fuels, uh, the Commission announced uh, the launch of a new initiative, uh, the European Energy Efficiency Financing Coalition, where we clearly need to find a good acronym, as Peter was telling us before. The objective is to create uh, a common framework uh, for cooperation between the Commission, member states, and financial institutions uh, to step up uh, private financing for energy efficiency. And this framework is expected uh, to work both as a space for setting the high-level priorities for cooperation and as a tool for the high quality expert work uh, that we experienced in AFIG, which is fundamental to drive us forward efficiently. And of course, uh, the aim would be to change, uh, wherever necessary, the regulatory framework in order to make it apt uh, for the challenges ahead. 
this coalition, in fact, uh, should uh, enable the work at the regional and local level, together with the competent authorities in the member states, uh, tackling uh, concrete barriers for energy efficiency to help the implementation of the new financing provisions uh, in the Energy Efficiency Directive and in the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive uh, with the aim of reaching the decarbonization goals by 2050. And for this, uh, I am confident uh, that the EFI community will remain committed uh, to this challenge and is ready to uh, continue working with the Commission and in this case also in a much closer way with the Member States. And the uh, appropriate time uh, we will get, get back to you with more details uh, on the Coalition Initiative. For now, let's, uh, let us go back to EFIG. It is the time uh, for the celebrations uh, and I look forward uh, to getting to know the results uh, of all these uh, very important uh, discussions. And finally, also on behalf of uh, uh, MECTIL Versorfer, I would like to take the opportunity to thank all of you uh, who contributed uh, to AFIG and to make uh, this uh, uh, initiative, uh, such a long-lasting initiative, successful throughout uh, these last 10 years, uh, and uh, this will be still felt uh, and uh, uh, listened to in the years to come. Many thanks. Thank you again, Claudia. And it's um, what I've certainly learned during this period of time is that the policy machine, as it were, has quite a lot of inertia. So actually, the fact that we have, are publishing at and around this event a number of landmark reports which will be seen for the first time, took two years to write, that the impacts of them will still only be felt in the, in the operationalization in the, in the coming uh, few years. So it is true to say that the, the legacy of EFIG is still not yet uh, fully, um, shall we say, developed. So uh, without further ado, it's an absolute privilege um, of us to have uh, Rolf Fein Coopers here, who is the Global ESG Client Officer and co-chair of DWS's External ESG Advisory Board and the member of the DWS Global Sustainability Committee. Now, DWS has been, as a, as a private sector actor, one of the stalwart supporters of EFIG since the very beginning. Um, and Rolfin, aside from uh, her time at uh, DWS, where she's been for a decade, she worked at Deutsche Bank in the global equities uh, environment from 1995. She's a board member of the DB Americas Foundation. She's been chairwoman of Women on Wall Street for many years, and she's helped establish uh, Deutsche Bank's uh, Women in European Business Initiative. She was, in fact, named one of the 25 most powerful women in finance by American Banker magazine, and she served on numerous academic and advisory boards uh, to the arts, diversity, and education. So Rothfein is originally from the Netherlands, uh, and she holds a master's in history from Leiden University, and she's going to talk to us about DWS's experience in, in the EFIG and other matters. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Uh, I have some slides. Um, are they being put up? Or do I click them? Okay, I'll start without the slides. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation, uh, Peter, to speak at this very important event. Uh, DWS is a net zero committed asset manager and we are publicly listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. We currently manage 821 billion euros across all major asset classes for both retail and institutional clients globally. We're very honored and proud to be a founding member of EFIC represented by my colleague Murray Bird from our research team who is an active steering committee member. On behalf of DWS and the steering committee, I would like to congratulate all members of the EFIC community for 10 years of excellent work. Energy security, extreme climate impacts, inflation and the cost of living crisis have made energy efficiency even more critical than it was a, a decade ago. The EFIC community of 300 organizations has much to be proud of. This includes helping establish energy efficiency as the first principle of European energy policy, being a model for the EU Sustainable Finance Technical Expert Group and recent investor group on renewable energy, supporting multiple projects such as the Energy Efficient Mortgage Initiative and the science-based real estate net zero tool CREM. It has issued 10 reports covering more than 1,000 pages 
as the formal output for market players to discuss detailed policy challenges with policymakers and the input collectively provided to commission officials helped them shape multiple important policy documents and proposals that have significantly strengthened policies for energy efficiency, particularly in response to the war in Ukraine. A big thank you to the European Commission, UNEPFI, IFIX rapporteur Peter Swetman, all of you and many, many others for creating and supporting IFIC. This slide shows a range of energy efficiency related investor focused organizations that will be important to accelerate the transformation of Europe's buildings, including several that DWS is a member of. In December last year at our Capital Markets Day, when we updated stakeholders regarding our business strategy, DWS and our largest shareholder, the Deutsche Bank Group, announced a strategic focus on European transforma transformation, including energy efficiency. We set a goal of raising more than 20 billion euros into new and existing private market funds. For instance, we aim to provide loans to small and medium-sized companies that focus on Europe's medical, technology and supply chain challenges. A portion of these loans could help energy efficiency. Last week at our AGM, our CEO Stefan Hoops restated our commitment as a company and as a fiduciary investor to contribute to a more sustainable future. Energy efficiency should be understood by policymakers and financial institutions as a multi-asset class challenge and opportunity. Different asset classes have different types of institutions, market rules and regulations that have different abilities and maturities to support and create real world change such as energy efficiency. We therefore strongly welcome the intent to evolve EFIC into an energy efficiency coalition. The most sophisticated asset classes on energy efficiency are real estate and project funds. We are honored to run the European Energy Efficiency Fund for the Commission since 2011. This fund has so far committed nearly 200 million euros to 43 public sector organizations, such as helping a major hospital in Italy significantly reduce its energy use. Real estate is either owned directly in private equity funds or in listed real estate companies. It is encouraging that each year, thousands of real estate and infrastructure investors with trillions in assets are rigorously assessed by Grasby. The EU and investor funded CREM initiative is increasingly being used as a science-based guide to net zero and energy, energy efficiency in real estate. Infrastructures, uh, infrastructure investors are also increasingly examining energy efficiency. For example, a DWS infrastructure fund owns Blue Pearl, a company which has acquired 15 small energy service companies to help them expand. However, real estate investors are not yet reducing energy use fast enough. EU sustainable finance policies are not yet sufficiently aligned with real estate investor needs. And certainty would be improved with an ambitious finalization of the energy performance in buildings directive. It is also encouraging that many banks are implementing net zero targets while investors have published net zero expectation for banks. For instance, Deutsche Bank recently published its sustainable mortgage strategy and the energy efficient Mortgage Initiative is also working with many banks. EFIC's report also shows that energy efficient mortgages have lower financial risk. And there are more private debt funds lending to small and medium companies, real estate and infrastructure assets. 
Many of these funds increasingly aim to set sustainability goals for lendees with interest rate incentives. However, there are some challenges. Bank and insurance regulations have not yet officially recognized the reduced risk from energy efficient loans and investments. Mortgage portfolio standards will likely be necessary to strengthen all banks' efforts. As well, the cost of living and interest rate impacts the ability of many people to take on new renovation loans. Shareholder, bondholder and bank engagement with publicly listed companies and their supply chains also plays a critical role. More companies are indeed setting science-based targets. Investors and banks are increasingly engaging with companies, including the Green Engagement Initiative for listed real estate. However, the Climate Action 100 Plus Engagement Initiative found that most carbon intensive companies are not aligning their capex or lobbying with net zero. And many oil and gas companies are weakening their climate targets. As well, many sensible AGM investor resolutions are not sufficiently supported by shareholders, which does not send a strong signal to companies. There is great potential for the coalition. The aim should be to truly put energy efficiency first at the regulatory level, amongst financial institutions where possible, at the energy system and infrastructure level, and at the deal or asset level. Essentially, we need to see energy efficiency getting double the political and public capital, double the number of experts, with double the cross-ministerial government collaboration. And this could help double private sector investments. I have four overarching comments and four recommendations to conclude. First, the coalition is an opportunity for dialogue between senior financial institution representatives, the European Commission, member states, and even internationally. For instance, the coalition could create a partnership with the finance ministers for climate coalition and deepen the partnership with the International Energy Agency to support the goal recently agreed by 45 countries to double energy efficiency. The coalition could be assisted by the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance report stating that it expects asset managers to undertake climate policy advocacy to change the rules of the game. EFIC's model could, should be expanded to other Green Deal areas like industrial and agricultural policies. The coalition is an opportunity for deeper dialogue and action across the real estate value chain. For instance, how can banks and investors help ramp up supply chain capacity and building renovation skills in the context of the US Inflation Reduction Act? And fourthly, the coalition should collaborate with financial net zero alliances. The four specific ideas are as follows. First, there is a need to improve and reform sustainable finance policies and Paris aligned benchmark rules to expect and require more and stronger investor stewardship and policy advocacy. As well, real estate associations with input from DWS and others recently made specific recommendations for SFDR. Secondly, Revenue for retrofits means strengthening the economic case. In many countries, electricity is three to four times more expensive than fossil gas. The balance of energy taxes needs reform to improve the attractiveness of technologies like heat pumps. As member states are still debating energy tax reform, the coalition could provide input towards a common position. There should be a link between electricity market reform 
and efficiency. The EFIC Private Sector Steerings Committee 2020 letter to Commissioner Simpson recommended learning from many US states which enable utilities to pr procure energy savings. The Horizon Project Sensei concluded this idea could indeed be applied in Europe. Thirdly, a group of major real estate investors concluded that there is a stranded asset risk in real estate, partially due to the non-institutional real estate owners outside of prime value regions who have less climate expertise. The coalition, for example, could work with the Urban Land Institute to support their objective that we can no longer make the cost to decarbonize buildings a competitive part of transactions. New market practices, data sharing and tools need to be developed to help all commercial building owners to fairly decarbonize. And finally, a compelling consumer proposition. To address loan affordability challenges, there is a need for the EU to partner with banks to create a new way for homeowners to easily and cost-effectively finance renovations with skilled, quality-assured tradespeople. The elderly, the poor, those without savings and with tight budgets need help to make their homes energy efficient, energy efficient with long-term affordable loans to scale up home renovation rates. DWS and Deutsche Bank mortgage lending colleagues support the European renovation loan concept as developed by Peter Swetman in his capacity as CEO of Climate Strategy and Partners. This idea should work alongside mortgage portfolio standards and ambitious efficiency standards to make renovation simple and affordable. I hope you found my comments useful and I very much look forward to the ongoing discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rolf Fine, for that um, extremely detailed and uh, engaged uh, presentation. Thank you, Murray, for your con consistency and for, to DWS and Deutsche Bank for their ongoing support to the EFI group, which has been consistent throughout that time. The, we'll now turn to the panel, um, and each one of our panelists today, who I'll introduce in turn, um, have been a key contributor to one of the brand new eFig uh, reports. So going down the line, each one of the panelists will have a five minute uh, set of initial words, and then we'll turn to a quick fire Q&A and hopefully in engage you, the audience, in that question and answer uh, session. So first of all, uh, to my right, we have uh, Nevis de la Valle. N uh, Nevis is a scientific project officer at the JRC, where she applies behavioral insights to energy relevant issues. And they range from energy efficiency to energy poverty. Prior to the JRC, Nevis was at the Institute for Renewable Energy, URAC, in Italy. And she was also a visiting researcher at the Max Planck Institute in Bonn. She has a PhD in economics and management from the University of Trento. Uh, specializing in behavioral and experimental economics with a thesis on the interplay between the social context and decision making, with visiting experiences at the University of Copenhagen and Durham Business School. Nevis was one of the key members of the recently completed EFIG working group on stimulating consumers' demand uh, for energy efficiency investments. So, Nevis, please. Thanks a lot, Peter, for the kind introduction. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here today and to represent the working group stimulating. Uh, consumers demand on, uh, on energy efficiency. So um, I also have some slides, so uh, maybe the pointer. There it yes. is, I got it, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot. So here we are, great. So um, yes, uh, I was a member of the working group stimulating uh, consumers uh, demand for energy efficiency and uh, with the need to explain why we are here to talk about uh, energy efficiency, why it is important. We, we have uh, heard uh, from the keynote speakers before compelling reasons why energy efficiency is crucial to reach uh, the climate change goals, to, to make uh, the European Union uh, independent uh, as well. Uh, 
uh, and uh, we also heard uh, the, the unparalleled uh, um, enhancing framework that we have in the European Union that enables really to, to make energy efficiency adopted uh, um, um, in the most diffused way. But despite uh, all these enhancing framework, what we observe is uh, that uh, we could do more. So in the sense that uh, the actual rate of uh, energy efficiency adoption uh, is still uh, far behind what we could do if we want really to unlock the full potential of energy efficiency. And this is uh, usually called the energy efficiency gap if we want to adopt uh, a, a technical term. Uh, so that means that if we want really to achieve the social optimal rate of energy efficiency adoptions, then we really need to go through all those uh, barriers uh, that uh, today we, uh, we'll briefly mention to you. Of course, there are uh, economic barriers, but there are also many non-economic barriers. And actually, uh, this is uh, the topic of uh, the, the work of the working group stimulating uh, uh, consumers' demand for energy efficiency that really benefited from a variety of perspectives from different sectors. And the aim of uh, the work of these groups was really to identify the, that plethora of barriers. Of course, we are not doing uh, new research, uh, but uh, collecting information available out there. And so that was uh, also a way to identify way to overcome these uh, barriers uh, and, uh, of course, provide policy recommendations because we want to solve problems. So um, before uh, um, uh, the analysis that we conducted, uh, we had to, uh, to make some assumptions uh, and to, uh, to make a disclaimer. Of course, uh, uh, energy efficiency can be adopted uh, by different uh, individuals. We also heard the SMEs, the firms. So the first thing that we had to do was to make a differentiation of the categories uh, of those who can really do the decision to adopt uh, energy efficiency. And so just to mention some categories here, uh, we, uh, of course, have to mention the, the different uh, de decision that can be made by the owner or the tenant, uh, or for instance, uh, so here we see, uh, for instance, the tenant uh, that perhaps would like to make that decision but doesn't have the power to do so most of the times. Or, for instance, uh, we here can mention uh, um, households uh, who um, are in uh, multi-apartment uh, buildings or in an, an, a detached house. So this also makes some, uh, some insights on uh, how decision can be actually shaped. And finally, uh, as also we heard before, we need to pay attention to the most vulnerable because those are really those who are most in need of energy efficiency but don't have the power, don't have the financing to make this decision. So this was really the, the category and uh, as I said, the aim was really to make uh, um, uh, an overview of this plethora of barriers that uh, shape the decision to, to adopt an energy efficiency. Of course, we won't have the time today to, to all in, uh, in details on, uh, to delve into details uh, uh, in all of them. But just to mention some, uh, we can mention the main categories. Of course, the economic barriers, uh, and we heard uh, uh, a lot about the need of financing, but here we also talk about the alignment of incentives. So split incentives is, uh, of course, the, the most prominent one. So the one, uh, uh, the disalignment uh, in the incentives of the tenant and the landlords, for instance. But the decision to invest is also uh, inhibited by information barriers. Uh, sometimes there are many financing options, but then uh, the individuals don't really make use of those financing options simply because they are not aware of. So these also play a key role. And finally, the decision-making process. So the decision actually to invest in energy efficiency is a very complex one. It entails uh, social variables, uh, individual variables, also the need of cognitive resources because we need to make an assessment not only of the, the high uh, sometimes uh, investment that we need to do in the present, but we also need to make an assessment of the future cost uh, savings. So this requires uh, uh, a lot of cognitive resources. So just uh, uh, to conclude, uh, we need uh, here to mention uh, the multifaceted barriers that shape uh, the, the, the decision to invest. And so we really need to make use of what is available out there. And uh, here, uh, the key uh, instrument that uh, we identified as really um, uh, prominent uh, that, that will should play uh, an even more prominent role in the future is the one-stop shop, because it really enables to overcome simultaneously all this plethora of barriers. And I'm sure that we will have the time also to go in details later on in the, in, in the panel. Uh, 
So uh, with this, I thank you very much for your attention, and I also encourage you to, to keep an eye on uh, the website of the IFI group, because the report where you can uh, see all the details on, uh, on the work that we have done will be published soon. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Nevis. Thank you for making <laughs> con con condensing so much detail into such a short uh, window. But you will have an opportunity to ask questions to our panelists in the Q&A session a little later. So moving on, um, Marcus Seifert is a partner at Define. Um, he has an extensive experience in project engagements with banks, supervisory authorities, asset managers, insurance underwriters in Central Europe and in the Nordics. Uh, Marcus has a PhD from the Technical University in Munich, and he has an MBA from ESSEC in Paris and the University of Mannheim. Uh, Marcus uh, led the recently completed EFIG Working Group on Collecting and Monitoring Data on Energy Efficiency Investments and Financing, um, and I've had the pleasure to, to co-lead both that work together with him and previously, as you heard mentioned, the important critical report that, uh, that shows the correlation between energy efficiency and credit risk. Marcus. So thanks a lot, Peter, for this kind introduction. And first of all, thanks a lot to everybody who has contributed to the both working groups, actually. So it was really a pleasure for me to work in those very intense working groups. I think it was really something which kept me occupied for quite some nights. And um, this was a really great experience. And I particularly like this kind of project-based work in EFIX. So I think this was really something special with a target you want to hit. And you really want to go into these details and work it out for, uh, yeah, for the good of, of, of us all and also for really going into the uh, climate neutral world at some point. So um, today I will focus on the recent report we've been publishing on data. So I don't know if there's any way to show the slides. Thank you. So um, because what we tried to do uh, this time was actually to answer a very simple questions. So how much money is actually invested into energy and efficiency in Europe? And that sounds very trivial, and you can read a lot of numbers, and you can look at a lot of data sets. Um, um, but it turns out it's actually not so simple. Um, the good news is actually there is a lot of data. So we have been examining like 50, more than 50 data sets in detail. We talked to the people. We looked into the data itself and tried to come up with an assessment. Okay, does this actually give us an overall number on those investments in, in Europe? And um, so what we have found here is really that data is there, so it's not that there is no data. The only issue which comes up is uh, basically that we, don't can ag we cannot aggregate the numbers together. So each and every project has a certain focus and really uh, takes out of a particular uh, element out of this whole universe and gives a number for that one or collects data on certain projects, on real estate, on corporates, um, making business surveys. So there are many, many uh, ways to collect those uh, interesting data points. And I would like just to mention a few of them. So, for example, the IEA spending a lot of time on their methodology, collecting, uh, uh, yeah, using their data, but also collecting new data. And uh, so they have a quite good estimate. Um, the EIB um, investment survey, for example, is another one, but they also have added questions on energy efficiency, basically asking question, uh, uh, corporates how much do they spend in terms of the overall investments into energy efficiency. And that's actually quite nice because it's like 15,000 companies to be asked. So you can really take these data points and uh, look at those numbers to get an estimate of the corporate investments into energy efficiency, which is good. However, what about real estate? So, um, and you see a bit, the, uh, it's not so easy to combine like corporates and real estate. And this is something which definitely has to be worked upon in the future if we really know, want to know where we stand at the moment and also where, uh, that we can monitor the progress. So I guess we have to, it's very clear that we have to invest more money. We have to really find ways to get this money efficiently to the, uh, to the addressees. And this is something where this monitoring is really crucial that we know how much money is spent year on year and do we get to the targets we, we need to achieve. So this is really, from our perspective, from the working group's perspective, really a call to action. So we have made a groundwork here. So we assess the data sets. We can come up with conclusions on what could be improved here, how this can be tackled. And I think this is something really has to be, even after EFIC in the condition maybe, um, picked up upon again and really uh, worked uh, um, to more details and really make it, make it practical. And just to give you some ideas, and this is going a bit beyond what we have been discussing. So 
Um, I mean, we, what we also saw, and there are quite nice initiatives in Europe um, where companies pick up some, um, for example, artificial intelligence methods to actually make it easier to collect this very um, comprehensive data and uh, along the building uh, life cycle, basically. So well, we have seen that it's a building is not a static thing. Uh, a building is something which is built, which is, let's say, renovated, which maybe it's teared down at some point. And what we need to do is really track this over time, and we have to get people involved to um, make this data available to wh whoever needs that. And I think this is the tricky part here, um, how to make this possible without being it completely infeasible. And the good thing is, I mean, we all have these nice uh, smartphones here, and um, there's a wallet in there. And for example, one of the ideas which could be used there is, you give them a wallet, you, they have the, for example, the energy efficiency, uh, the energy performance certificates in there, they have also other building data in there, they can share data, they can, uh, can track data, they can share with their workers, um, the, with the architects, um, so to make the, like the consumer in the center of, the, of these initiatives, that they have the control over the data via their phones, but nevertheless, we have, for example, a European data trustee, where you then can aggregate the data and get the statistics out of that one. So I think we really have to work on these practical issues to make it feasible and e really easy to use. And I think everybody made this experience already. If it's easy to use, people will use it. If it's too complicated, th there's no chance to get it through. And I think we ha need to get to this step, really, to collect the data, to know where we are, to see where we are going, to are we doing enough or not yet, but also to provide this uh, convenience element to people actually having control of their, uh, of their data, having it somewhere like a boarding pass in, in your wallet. And I think this is something we should really try to uh, go for and um, yeah, use all technologies available to actually solve the data challenge here. And yeah, that's my comment for today. So thanks a lot, Peter, for inviting me. And if there are questions, of course, um, yeah, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. And again, uh, questions to Marcus will be taken in the panel. Uh, and thank you so much for raising this very misunderstood uh, point about data. Um, I think um, uh, Carsten Glinting and I, Carsten is one of the hardworking people who's not on the panel today, but has been one of the s sort of stalwart members of the EFIG uh, consortium since, um, since phase two. Um, but we were discussing how the, uh, a government's role is to provide uh, the people who need data, the data they need. So I think we need to think a lot harder, and this is a great example from that di diagram, which is how do we get the right data to the right people without sharing all our data to the world and then having different organizations from different countries get in there and use our data against us or use our data to further you know, their uh, commercial aims as opposed to allowing, you know, for example, project managers in Germany to have the data about a specific property in order to be able to provide that property a renovation plan. But uh, before we get into that big subject, um, I'd like to bring uh, Frederick Nielsen into the conversation. Frederick is the head of group sustainability at Swedbank. He is responsible there for developing and monitoring and reporting of Swedbank's sustainability strategies and goals. And prior to joining Swedbank in 2017, Frederick was Nordic CSR lead at Accenture. Uh, Frederick is on the board of directors of the Swedish House of Finance at the Stockholm School of Economics, which is Sweden's national research center for financial economics. Frederick has been a very active member of EFIG, including the working group on applying the energy efficiency first principle in sustainable finance, and will offer some insights and his experience. Frederick. Thank you, Peter. Uh, privileged to be here. Uh, and I can't imagine that 10 years have passed um, already, and there's a lot of more things to do, right? Uh, but to, to begin with, then, Swedbank, for those who not, do not know, uh, a retail bank, uh, primarily focusing on the Swedish market, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, um, having 7 million private customers, but also 600,000 corporate customers. So it's all about bringing this agenda to the many. Um, so I want to start with just by saying that. And having the privilege then to put out some of the conclusions from this great work and report on um, energy efficiency first, the principle really, um, and uh, putting credit to all of those being involved through EFIG in producing the report. Uh, but just to start with, um, I think what we can conclude is that the energy efficiency, just as we have heard, is too little, it's too slow, and just as circular, um, I can't really understand why more people don't act more dilig dilig diligently on this, because the business case is so good for everyone. 
Second thing is that we do have some public banks that have really paved the way and they should have credit and we should continue learning from their leadership uh, as EIB and others, but also some private banks. Uh, Swedbank, we got really engaged, um, but also very inspired by some Dutch banks in 2017 and 18. Uh, so for sure, there are some leading banks out there uh, that is also trying to scale. But what we can uh, say is that um, looking at the barriers then, and much have been said already in this meeting, but um, there, there is certainly a, a disconnect or not a connect or not a linkage between the regulatory frameworks that are out there and being you know, the prominent frameworks that will in fact set the future. Uh, it's becoming better, I know that, uh, on SFDR and etc. cetera, but you know, there are big vehicles, regulatory vehicles on sustainable finance out there and we need to get it really detailed into those. Uh, second one is within banks and financial institutions. There isn't enough competence, capacity, concrete tools on different levels. Uh, but there are tools that we have found in this report. So I really encourage you to go in there um, and use what is already there uh, and apply those. Um, but we can also say that it, this drives bureaucracy within the banks as well. And bureaucracy seems to also come into your space, you know? If the solutions aren't simple when the customers want to talk about their problems, then bureaucracy uh, definitely put up a barrier. Um, but we can also see that banks can be much more proactive. Um, and in the end of the day, um, I feel that banks always refer to, oh, you know, we don't have the data and we don't have the exact data and the real-time data, so we can't act. We cannot put... Um, pricing mechanisms and apply pricing me mechanisms on retail level. Uh, but you know what? It's, sorry to say it in this house, but it's bullshit. Uh, it's, we, we have enough data to act on uh, and get going in all retail banks in Europe uh, and across the world. But I think this report highlights three levels. It, it highlights the reasons for acting both on policy or, or strategy level, but also on portfolio, and in the end of the day, on deal level uh, for banks. So I will also take the opportunity here now, uh, very shortly, to reflect from, from Swedbank point of view then, because where we came from was that in, in 2007, 2008, we put out our first consumer loan with the purpose of driving energy efficiency. Uh, it wasn't a big uh, sales component, I can just say that. Very few uh, adopted that, even if pricing was good. Uh, but in Sweden particularly, uh, we have had a great energy mix for a while. So there hasn't been any carbon or climate reasons to act, to be honest. And price on energy has been way too low. Um, but we also moved uh, energy efficiency into our funding framework. <laughs> Um, and obviously, we could see on the capital market that we got paid back uh, for pri providing the right assets to the capital market, but we didn't scale either. We put in partners, we were kind of subsidizing deals and everything, but we didn't get into sales scale. So therefore, we went into, you know, what are the standards around mortgage? We need to find bigger levers across Europe to, um, to do this work. And EFIG has been, you know, the guiding star for us in this work. So I really want to thank all EFIG members and especially Peter for, for doing this work. Um, but ending off, ending off is that we took a step last year where we put it at the center of our business strategy and did a piece of work that I can come back to uh, later in the panel. And that has really at least boosted not only our board, <laughs> our executive team, our customers, our products, our offering in the market, uh, but in the end of the day, uh, just showing this picture then. There's a lot of things to be done um, around our properties, and in the end of the day, this is what it's all about. It's about houses, and we can see that it is far from impossible to reach 50% improvement levels in these investments. So we're keen to do more. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Frederick. And <laughs>
we will certainly direct questions at you to allow you to expand upon those important points. And I certainly want to quote you when you said it's bullshit. We've got enough data to get started. I thought that was very poignant. Um, so uh, what we're going to do now is we have around 20 minutes. We started a bit late, so perhaps the session will go on uh, perhaps a little beyond the one o'clock finish. But um, I've got some questions to the panel from myself based on what they've said. But also, we're going to take just after a round of quick fire questions from them, we're going to take questions from the audience and from those of you online. Um, uh, just cast a quick note, I'm not completely sure how I read. I've gone to Slido and I can't see any questions there, but if you do, then let me know. Um, so first of all, Nevis, just following up with what you'd said about the split incentives, really. So, I mean, you really have studied behavioral economics. Can you talk to us a bit more about landlords' motivations with some behaviorally informed interventions that can show us how you can get over that um, bridge? Thanks a lot, Peter, for, uh, for this question. Indeed, uh, split incentives uh, should uh, deserve a bit uh, more words today. Uh, and I say that also because um, uh, as a reminder, we want also to, to reach the most vulnerable. Split incentives play a role, uh, especially in the pri private, uh, the private sector, the rented sector, and there is uh, the, the Horizon project, uh, um, MPOR, that actually focuses exactly on, uh, on that, so it's split incentive mm. and, uh, and also the effect on the, the most vulnerable and the energy poor. And I'm saying that because uh, as a behavioral economist, uh, we want actually to focus on uh, the, the context that uh, where individuals make decisions. So as a choice architects and policy makers, we should always aim to, to design uh, the, the, the best ch um, choice environment where individuals can make uh, their decisions. In this case, the decision to invest. The split incentives uh, means that uh, a landlord might not want to invest because uh, uh, cannot uh, see the, the benefits uh, uh, directly, and uh, the benefits usually here are um, benefited directly by, by the tenant. Uh, and so what we can see, uh, what we can say today is that perhaps we should make more salient those uh, pro-social motivations that are uh, always uh, uh, with us. So we, we spoke about barriers, uh, but we can also speak about uh, behavioral drivers. Uh, and uh, behavioral economics actually alight that uh, we as, uh, as individuals don't always uh, care about our self-interest, but we also care about uh, others' well-being. And uh, sometimes we just uh, don't realize uh, that because the decision-making decision context is too complex. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, th there, are some, there is some noise that we should actually, um, uh, that we should work on. And so one thing that we can do is to make salient uh, those uh, benefits in terms of increasing comfort on the tenants, uh, so the increase in health. And uh, instead of only highlighting uh, monetary savings or uh, uh, emission savings that might uh, be associated with the decision to invest, uh, at the moment of making the decision, we should also make salient those uh, benefits for the tenants. Mm -hmm. So the decision can become really a pro-social decision. And uh, uh, I will just uh, mention again the one-stop shop because here the one-stop shop can really uh, work for both the tenant and the landlord, making the case for the landlord to invest, making again salient those uh, benefits for the tenant, uh, and perhaps also reducing the, the fear of uh, renovation that, that might actually prevent the tenant to demand uh, a, 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 a renovation that is very needed for, the, for his or her comfort. And so uh, here again, the one-stop shop can, uh, can solve uh, many of these barriers uh, and leverage those uh, uh, pro-social mo motivations that are always with us. Thank you. Yes, a lot in there. Um, EFIG published on the multiple benefits and monetizing the multiple benefits of energy efficiency uh, in a report which is available on, on, on our website. And of course, um, f making sure that we're, we're delivering the benefits to the people who see them is important. And even landlords need the data to know that the, that the value of their property is going to go up. As a result, they're not going to be stranded, and, th and they're going to continue to be able to rent them a long time into the future, even in a world where there are uh, minimum energy performance standards that will come in and affect that. But Marcus, tell us about what are the most pro promising data sets that you encountered in the working group's discussions, um, which, which talk to the kind of uh, data sets that will be necessary for us to use more frequently in the future. 
Yeah, so I, I think we encountered quite some of them. So I mean, I mentioned two already, so like the uh, IEA, but also the EIBIS, um, but also to name a few more, for example, Antrack that is doing an incredible job also like uh, with the connection to a deep database uh, for buildings. I think that's really a great uh, starting point to, to go for, but also let's say on a local level, like in France with Opera and so on. So I mean, there, there are really a lot of initiatives focusing on uh, collecting crucial data and actually just to comment on the uh, the topic about do we have enough data, um, I think we have enough data to act. So this is definitely the case. So it's not there's no excuse to not act because you supposedly have no data. But of course, we also need to bring the data together to really know the total numbers th then in the very end. So I think there are really some very interesting data sets out there. Um, and we have to really think about who actually also, wh wh who should uh, co collect those data, let's say, on a European level. So, I mean, there's a lot of talk about the member states, but in the end, we also have to get the member states together or keep them together, harmonize a little bit between the member states. I mean, this is something which I think has not been addressed so far, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing this also in the coalition. Yes, absolutely right. But uh, now moving back to Sweden, um, you mentioned at the end of your comments, Fred, that you wanted to develop the experience that Swedbank's had really doing home renovations and saving half the energy bills. I mean, what do your customers say about energy efficiency today? Yeah, I think, you know, what we have seen in Ukraine has obviously affected us uh, to a very large extent, but uh, our customers hate energy bills nowadays. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, that is not good, obviously, but that has driven behavioral changes. Mm. Um, and we can see everything between 10 to 30% of just behaving differently. And then what we're trying to apply on top is the investments that can be made that will decrease the volatility of their cash flow. Uh, so that's one thing, the energy bills. Uh, the second thing is that they believe it's too hard, still too hard. The one-stop shop is really something we believe in. Mm. We, be we believe in that the bank can be the distribution superpower vehicle for, for bringing this to scale, in fact. But then we, we need to be the ecosystem producers. That is what we believe in. Mm. Uh, and the, the third and last thing is that I know we want to do things that are good for others, but we also find our client base, yeah, we can find 10 or 12 or 13% that are willing to pay more, but then the majority of people, they are financially rational. Uh, so they want to see the financial benefits and the valuation of the property, et cetera, mm. being on the positive side. And that can come from public incentives, but it can also come from rate uh, pieces. So we have zero rate kind of loans on energy efficiency right now in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and they sell like crazy for the moment. Maybe a little bit too good, in fact. Uh, but but just t we're testing different approaches. But yeah, energy bills, it's too hard, and financial benefits need to be there. Brilliant. You've touched on a subject which I personally have done some calculations on. So I don't know if anybody knows how many bank branches there are in Europe. Well, the answer is 138,000. Um, does anybody know how many re renovations that have to be done in Europe every year? Three million, give or take. Um, and how many, so if every bank branch trains just three project managers, then we'd have enough project managers, 350,000, to do the renovations that are needed in Europe. And it's something that we've skipped around. People love talking about one-stop shops, and Nevis, we're going to come back to you. Uh, not exactly on that, but uh, one-stop shops is a lovely uh, a sort of expression, and there's been lots of pilots, but how are we going to get to 350,000 of them? I don't think we will, not in time, but we will. But can I comment on that, Peter? Yes, <laughs> because the branches is one thing, obviously very important. I mean, in Sweden, I think we have 200 of them right now, but we, we, we have almost 3 billion digital interactions mm. on our platform every year, 3 mm. billion. So we definitely believe that digital is a way of scaling things. And then, uh, yeah, we have Hema, an energy efficiency advisor platform. Uh, that we put into our customer flow. We have e-agronom, prioritizing those clients in the agriculture space. So yeah, branches for sure, mm. don't forget digital. Of course, and the data tools. But coming to, to you, Nevis, um, there's um, a group of, uh, and, and uh, it was alluded to earlier when uh, Rofflin said that uh, there's, a, there's a need to find instruments that can provide renovation finance to the most needy, the people who perhaps can't access credit. So how do we promote financial inclusion for energy efficiency projects? 
Thanks, Peter. And uh, indeed, also financial inclusion is, uh, is extremely key. Uh, and actually, that also enables us to, to remind ourselves that uh, uh, when we want to promote energy efficiency, we also have an opportunity not only to address uh, climate change and to promote the energy transition, but uh, if we make uh, also uh, the financial inclusion possible, then uh, we also make the transition fair. So we cannot leave anyone behind, and this is also part of the, the, the vision of the European Union, where citizens need to be at the center and everyone should be on board. So financial inclusion actually enables to do that. But how? That's the big question. So we also heard from uh, the, the previous uh, keynote speakers uh, that uh, there are also many innovative mechanisms that, mm. that we can leverage. One stop shop is also an example because uh, they can sometimes also offer or uh, make aware uh, individuals of some uh, um, financing instruments that might be available for them. Uh, and, uh, and, but I would like here to mention especially the microfinance uh, instrument because uh, um, it, it also instills that sense of agency that enables individuals, uh, the most vulnerable, to feel that they can do something. And this goes also under the direction of uh, energy citizenship. So that means that uh, the most vulnerable are not only helped by someone who is uh, in power, but they can feel that they can do something. And we also talk about uh, awareness. Sometimes uh, individuals uh, or uh, the low income uh, homeowners simply don't invest in energy efficiency because they think uh, that uh, they won't be given credit. But the microfinance institution actually make them feel felt trusted. Mm -hmm. And they can also speak uh, among their peers, among their community, that uh, there is uh, an instrument that they can also uh, leverage. And, uh, and also crowdfunding uh, is, uh, uh, is also a, a key instrument that I would like to mention. Uh, perhaps uh, this instrument won't reach the, the same scale of uh, public uh, uh, funds, but of course this might contribute still to, to create uh, that sense of uh, um, a, a common goal where everyone feels that is part of uh, doing something together. And actually, uh, reminding again that the energy poverty Energy efficiency is one of the three causes of energy poverty. And so if we make also the low income part of uh, the, uh, the financing of uh, energy efficiency projects, they, they will feel uh, not only that they are part of this, but the, the main cause will be directly um, addressed by, by themselves. I think you, you raise an, a, a critical issue. So with all due respect to the billions of uh, interactions <laughs> that there are online, I think we do need human beings to visit homes and to manage projects on behalf of people, be they the people who are um, potentially the recipients, the energy poor who are the recipients of 50 billion euros that's already allocated through the recovery packages to, the, uh, to this issue, um, but also future public-private instruments that may deal with that group that aren't perhaps, you know, uh, at, the, at the sort of like the, the furthest end of that spectrum, but sit within a range of affordability with respect of, uh, of income that, that need uh, that support. But Marcus, um, going back to the question of data, um, how do we um, understand that the set energy savings are going to be delivered and what data sets are there out there that can talk to that? So, um I think I mentioned already quite some of the data sets yeah. out there, right? So yeah. um, I don't want to recap all the 50 of, of those. Um, and um, I think there are two elements, of course. I mean, when you talk about, talk about energy savings, we have like the energy part and we have the financing part. So we need to know what kind of energy is saved and what, of, uh, um, what is the, uh, let's say, the financial benefit from, from that one. And I think, again, here we see a kind of split. So there's a good measurement on how the energy is the consumption is used. You can have a smart meter, whatever. You can collect that, that, that data. Uh, but to get this kind of linkage towards the, uh, towards the fin uh, financial part, that's not always so trivial. I mean, mm. of course, you can, the, uh, pro pro um, the power companies can provide you with that information. Um, but uh, again, it's a bit the question, what else is there involved? So is it just the, uh, the heating energy? Is it the, the electricity? Is it other types of energies I'm using? So this, this uh, topic is really complicated. So I would really come back to this major point of how to bring these things together. So this is, this is the crucial part, apart from, let's say, collecting data into region ABC on topic uh, Y. So it's really the aggregation part. Um, just because, Fred, you did jump in, I'm going to sw switch to the questions that are coming through for the slider, and I'm going to ask you to take the first one, which is from Anne um, Haunami. Um, she says, today the market seems passive, although the business case is pretty clear. What are the drivers of this 
lack of interest and what are the profitable investments. But the way I would like you to answer that is, what's your business case in, in, in Swedbank and how did you address this passivity of the market at Swedbank? I wouldn't say that we're done in any way, but on the, we're on the journey for sure. I think what we did last year, because we, we have done it incrementally, I would say for, for almost 10 years without any scale. Um, but then we, we took more of a strategic step, uh, looking at how could then also, in fact, fueled by the fact that we set up net zero commi commitments, but also intermediate goals towards 2030. Our, our mortgage portfolio, the emissions that we finance, they need to decrease with 39% in 2030. Then you need a how. <laughs> It's easy to set the target. It's not so easy, but you know, then you need a how. And out of that, we also concluded, you know, the properties, 80% uh, of our balance sheet is backed with properties. They need to move. And then we put out the business case for society in our four home markets. And believe it or not, we found the potential of saving 90 terawatt hours in our four home markets. <laughs> 200 billion euros is needed in green capex in these investments. The addressable lending market for this bank, our bank, is between, between four, uh, 40 and 80 billion euros. So the business case is brilliant. But the thing is, coming in now into the summer of 2023, Europe will be in a stage where m much emissions will be under the EU ETS, and you know, we will have emissions as finite resources. If, you don't, if, you're, if you're not addressing that on asset level or on company level, you will not be competitive tomorrow. So for banks right now, the business case for acting, you can just look at the risk. You, can, you, you don't need the business opportunity out there. Go for it as well, I think. But it's, it's just go for the risk. Uh, but you need to go big. Otherwise, it, you know, otherwise you will sit there with the bad assets uh, or you will sit there with the companies that, that won't transition. Talking of companies in transition, I love this next question that comes from quote unquote anonymous. So when I see an anonymous question that brings me to talk about the industrial energy efficiency work of the EFIG, I know that someone in this audience has been a part of that extensive industrial work that we've been, a, we've been focusing on is keen to hear the panel address, the important uh, opportunities that there are in European industry and manufacturing base to save energy. Uh, EFIG did an entire uh, working group and has a report on that, and the leader of that work is, is here, Rod Jansen and, and Carsten Glenting as well. Um, I was going to ask you, perhaps Nevis, perhaps throwing you a little bit in the, in the deep end here, but behavioral economics and the way in which companies are managed, these are human beings and they're deciding to not save energy in large companies. You know, we've come across it time and time again, we've written about it. What's kind of, what's going on? What are the barriers, what are the behavioral barriers for companies to, to save energy? Well, the one that uh, comes to my mind is for sure targeting managers here because managers sometimes might also change, so they might not be forever in, a, in that uh, firm. And so, of course, the decision to, to invest in energy efficiency uh, might also, uh, it's a decision that exerts some consequences over time, so the two things uh, might not align again. Uh, and so here I will say that uh, behavioral insights can help uh, really at targeting managers, so to make them aware also of the benefits of energy efficiency, uh, not only for, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the emissions, but again for, uh, for the benefits, for instance, for others and for, uh, for uh, the, the employees who work uh, in, uh, in, the, in the firm. Uh, and, um, and so it's really about uh, targeting their awareness. So mm. I would say that. Yeah, I'm personally particularly enthusiastic about mandatory energy efficiency or energy audits, and then having to having to work on the low hanging fruit, which I think you know both as a part of the transition and the hard to abate sector. We we have industrial heat, uh, for example, how it's produced and how it can be saved and reused in a circular economy. It's an, an enormous opportunity, I think, for for Europe. So uh, keeping with the Slido questions uh, for a minute. Uh, we just uh, what, so there's a couple of things that the first is about strategies and initiatives 
I think for energy communities, so my understanding of energy communities is just local groups that get together to, to save energy and support the transition. That's one question. Um, then uh, you talked about overcoming the energy uh, gap and the opportunities. And that, so another question, I'm pulling three in here, talks about how the, the policy framework stimulates large scale in, innovation. So there's three different questions there. And I think in, in, in the light of time, I don't know if anybody wants to, um, from, from the market, wants to pick up on any of those themes in the context of uh, where you're coming from. Maybe I might uh, ask you, Fred, you spent a lot of time thinking about energy efficiency first which is a, both a principle for policymakers quite well defined in European guidelines and indeed a principle for investors. In other words, how do we, um, how do we in, involve customers in the energy efficiency first conversation and think about that when it comes to large scale renovations, energy communities and other, and other modes of, of, of engagement? Yeah, what, what we believe in is at least that, that we, we need to put these questions into the, core, the the blood flow of retail banks. Uh, mm -hmm. That is the mortgage process. It's how we manage risk. And those are the only places we can be in because they touch the customer directly. So that is where we need to dig, mm -hmm. dig where we are in a sense. Secondly, to uh, make use of the distribution superpower through our digital tools. Uh, obviously, Sweden is very digital, Estonia as well, etc. Uh, but in the end of the day, our biggest worry is that this change will be disruptive, right? It will uh, make people's life uh, difficult. If you cannot insure your house, or for that sake, it's you cannot move to E in 2030, and you cannot move to, to a D uh, on your property in 2023, what happens then? Uh, what happens with the valuation of your property, etc. So what I believe is that the EU renovation loan that you have put forward, Peter, here, in order to get it inclusive, to minimize the risk of disruption in society is so, so important. Um, but I think, you know, put it in the blood flow, make the process simple and de-risking for, uh, for not only the wealthy ones to take action. Um, so those would be my three things. Brilliant. Um, I'm recognizing that we have a continued conversation that's going to happen at lunch downstairs at one o'clock. Um, we've got four minutes left on the clock, so I'm going to ask each one of our panelists in turn, and thank you for your questions um, in uh, the Slido. I didn't see any hands raised. It now would be a chance for you to do it. So if anybody wants to raise a hand at this moment, um, now would be the time. I don't want to exclude anyone in the room, but if not, um, what I'm going to ask is, in, sort of in, in, in turn, but in a slightly different order, I'm going to ask our panelists to close the session in a sort of one minute uh, sort of response to a specific sort of summary uh, 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 question, which for Marcus, um, I wanted to ask, so I really want to connect this to themes that we read about in the newspapers. And we're reading a lot about AI, chat GPT, machine learning, and the ways that data can be used in ways that we hardly imagined. So thinking about that and knowing that we're never going to have perfect data, what can we do on a more sophisticated level to support uh, b buildings renovation and energy efficiency investments in industry? Yeah, Peter, I think this is a huge uh, opportunity coming in here because, I mean, what we can do nowadays is really analyze data on a scale which is unprecedented, I think, and just look at all those uh, satellite images. We can see buildings from the top. We can make directly uh, 3D models of those buildings. So I think that a lot of the data issues actually will be resolved by those methods. And I think on a scale which is really much, uh, much better and uh, yeah, what we have seen in, uh, compared to what we've seen in the past. So this is really this is a huge change and it will help us a lot, I think, in this process till 2050. Thank you. And, and Nevis, you've, I, I think, I see the way you've come at this question is very much from the people-centric. So you're looking at the human dimension of energy efficiency, which, by the way, I think often in the conversation gets a bit lost. So I'm pleased that you brought that to the front. And if you could perhaps summarize just, just for the end of this panel, how we can build these more participative models and stimulate consumer demand as a result. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I think we need uh, policy mixes that are evidence-based. So, of course, we need to take the most of uh, what's uh, out there, so European projects, uh, best uh, practices, uh, and evidence, for instance, from behavioral sciences, so to that target to all those uh, multiple barriers that we have mentioned. And to make really inclusive uh, uh, this, uh, this endeavor, of course, we need to empower all sides, so tenants, uh, landlords, 
users, owners. So we need really to empower all of them through trainings, uh, financial literacy, energy literacy, and simplify the decision-making context. Uh, just to mention again one-stop shop, but it's really the key instrument that can really simplify and take, all, uh, take away all the cognitive burden from making this very complex but very effective decision to invest in energy efficiency. Thank you, Nevis. I'm going to suggest that you join uh, a new uh, advisory group, which I think needs to help the Net Zero Industry Act figure out academies. So there's, a, there's this massive need for training and repurposing the very talented people that we have in Europe. I mean, so you, every time I come to a discussion, it feels as though we don't have the, the right skills in Europe. I actually think we do have the right skills in Europe, but they're just misdirected. And I think the Net Zero Industry Act is perhaps a potential way for us to be able to look at what's needed and talk to the operators and perhaps train for that. Certainly, we also need more administrative staff that are trained to be able to deal with energy efficiency. So in closing, Fred, you are lucky enough to have the last word. And given your um, already um, very uh, welcome comments, we, the whole thing needs to come to scale really quickly. So we essentially, I mean, we have seven years. So literally, if you follow the energy efficiency directive, there is a binding final, final energy consumption target that requires Europe in, in roughly seven and a half, eight years to use a quarter less energy than we are today. That would be the most historical achievement that we've ever seen in energy efficiency. How on earth will we achieve it? Yeah, that's a moon landing, right? Uh, but we have done that before. I think that we're onto something because there, there is, in the end of the day, a saved kilowatt hour is better than a green, right? Um, and if we can save, we can also fuel that saved energy towards the other moon landings of having fossil free steel or cement for that sake those will require, or hydrogen, those will require massive amounts of energy tomorrow. So we can also contribute <laughs> indirectly to the big change that is happening. But I think the coalition is now our big lever because EFIG, we have produced so much, you know, concrete things. So I don't see that we need so much innovation, really. We just need to get the things applied that we already have. And I think if the coalition can really, in very practical terms, come to member states and say, you know, here's the toolbox. We advise that you start here and put out these blocks and get the work done. Very practical. So we dig where we are, we save, uh, and we spend in other places. So I, I have a big trust in, in the coalition being very practical with the member states. I think that then scale can come. Fantastic. Well, let's have a round of applause for all of my panel. <laughs> so the good news um, about today is that um, if you haven't heard enough about eFig, you can still hear more <laughs> um, over lunch. Uh, lunch will take place on the ground floor. Uh, you're all welcome. Um, and uh, it, would be, uh, it would be remiss of me in closing this not to thank uh, the, the 500 members of the eFig wider community um, and not to call out specifically, because I've just seen them in the room. I apologize um, if I haven't covered all of you. But Carsten Glinting has been an absolute stalwart supporter of this consortium throughout these years. Mark Hafner, who's helped us from the Covey team here locally in Brussels. Dina Smedrup, who couldn't come at the last minute, who's another uh, critical member from Covey's team. Steve Falks, Dr. Steve Falks, who is uh, leading um, uh, one of our working groups uh, also that uh, co-published an energy efficiency first. Um, Carlos. Uh, from Well, from Claudia's team, we've been interacting with Carlos, with Hadrian, with Eduardo, with Pierre Luca. Um, I noticed Adrian Bullier, from, who's been an old supporter of EFIG from, from, from a while back. We've had Martin Koch in the corner, used to be at FISMA now to ECFIN, and Rod Janssen, of course, who's been one of the most supportive members on e industrial energy efficiency we have. I'm sorry if I've missed your name out. Come and tell me, and I'll mention you at lunch. So um, with all, sorry, and Tatiana Bostil, who I've just seen, who, who has been with us since the, the very first meeting, previously at Hermes and now the IB. So, um, there have been so many of you, and I really, uh, you know, there are 120 people listed in the very first EFIG report. Since then, it's got up to 500. And again, that's another testament to the kind of work that we've done here and how we've been able to uh, keep your interest for, for, for a decade. So thanks. Um, join us downstairs, and that concludes our session.